Uh, good evening, very warm welcome to the British Library this evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, especially given the weather outside, but I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll feel very pleased that you did come the end of the night. And welcome to everybody watching the event online, wherever you may be around the world. Um, so we're absolutely delighted tonight to, to welcome to this stage uh, the renowned Nobel Prize winning mo molecular biologist, Venki Ramakrishnan, who is also uh, a board member here at the British Library and a good friend of the libraries. Uh, Venki will soon be talking about the themes of his new book, uh, why We Die, The New Science of Aging and the Quest for Immortality, uh, with uh, Anjana Ahuja. Anjana writes on science, uh, health and technology for the Financial Times and previously for the Times. And her books include the acclaimed Spike, uh, The Virus and the Versus the People on the Inside Story of the COVID-19 Pandemic. At the end of their conversation, you'll have your chance to ask your questions, to put your questions to Venki. And those watching online can also put questions as well via the, uh, the little screen, um, form below the video window. And we'll read out the, the best or as many of those as we can later on. Uh, and after all of that, Venki will be outside uh, signing copies of his new book. And you know, please uh, do stop and get one and have it, have it signed and have a drink at the bar. So, but first, I'd like to welcome, uh, to say a few words, um, the uh, Professor Dame Carol Black, who is uh, the chair of the British Library Board and has been since uh, 2018 and has many positions in public life and advisory roles to the government, departments on health, work, well-being and others uh, themes. Very pertinent to today's event. She's also the uh, chair of the Centre for Aging Better. So to, to start things off, uh, please, Professor Dame Carol Black. John, thank you very much. And let me just add a very warm welcome. And thank you so much for coming out uh, on an evening like this. We do indeed have Venki on the board of the library. Some of you will, will know, of course, that we started in the British Museum. And the British Museum has the right to um, nominate a member for the board of uh, the British Library. And Venki is indeed our British Museum um, a nominated member on the board. And we're very pleased um, about that. Um, this very wide-ranging book presents many themes and insights, and I'm sure and I will pursue them this evening. The introduction to the book makes us very aware, as those of you who've read it will know, about our mortality and the realisation of which is thought to be unique to humans and not shared by other animals. The book um, explores the fundamental physiological question of why we die. And as Venki says in the book, in some ways it's a romp uh, through a lot of modern molecular cell biology, but a romp that I think those of you who've read it will know is very understandable and in fact deeply enthralling. We learn more about how lifespan varies between species and that at present, the maximum human lifespan seems to be about 120 years, with the tantalising question, uh, which I'm sure will be addressed, of can it be extended? Advances in our ageing, as I think will be discussed, has come through many different kinds of individuals and from many different specialties. And there are often people working on seemingly very distant and unconnected topics. In the end, I'm delighted to say that Venki tells us that some rather simple things, all within our grasp, uh, give us the best chance of ageing well. So we need to sleep enough, we need to eat well, and we need to exercise. So Venki, I was very pleased this morning. I went to the, la uh, to the gym, and I thought as I did my exercises, I've actually improved my mitochondria. So there we are. Um, can I welcome you both to the stage and you can start uh, the conversation. So can we welcome Venki uh, and Anjana to the stage. I'm really excited about this conversation because I've, I too have read the book. I don't know how many of you have read it. How many have read the book? One. So plenty of copies outside. 
Um, so um, I'm a writer at the Financial Times, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here in person and to our audience online. Um, and as I wrote recently, longevity or human longevity is having a moment for, I think, several reasons. One is demography. I think by 2030, one in six people will be over 60. And half, and that's in the, in the world, and about half a billion of them will be over 80. Unimaginable a century ago. Another reason is the revolution in biology, which we're also going to explore, um, this idea that scientists are increasingly kind of drilling down and cracking the sort of the molecular processes, the cellular processes that lead to aging. And so naturally there is, uh, that leads us to our third, to my third, um, I think the interesting sort of trend at the moment, which is the, just the sheer amount of money going into longevity research. So uh, we just have the best conversation to come, I think, the really exciting things. So... Anyway, uh, thank you for doing this. And also, I should say, I've been following your articles on longevity in, in the FT and with, with a lot thank of you. interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. That makes me feel very proud. <laughs> um, so you are, Venki, the perfect guest to discuss these issues um, because of your book, why We Die, The New Science of Aging and the Quest for Immortality. Um, but I, I just want to give a little biographical introduction to Venki because, you know, it's a really interesting... that Your decision to write this book is quite interesting because you're not really in sort of deep down in ageing research. So you've got quite a, a kind of a bird's eye view of the whole, of the whole thing. But Venki leads a research group at the Medical Research Council's Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Um, he was president of the Royal Society uh, between 2015 and 2020, and you were appointed to the Order of Merit in 2022. So um, I, is that different from the knighthood? Because you are sir, thank you. <laughs> I yeah. was trying to look this up. I don't, I I don't actually, I don't use the, the title uh, myself. But um, no, the Order of Merit is, um, is apparently limited to 24 people. So somebody has to die before you get <laughs> Perhaps they should read the book. <laughs> very, very appropriate. And of, and of course, um, just as an aside, you know, apart from the Order of Merit, he's just backed himself a Nobel Prize as well. You know, in 2009, um, Venki won the Nobel, or shared the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his work on the structure and the function of the ribosome. And that's also the subject of his 2018 book, The Gene Machine, which is also excellent. So just for the format of the evening, we're going to have about 50 minutes um, in conversation. And uh, then we're going to open it up to a Q&A, uh, both here and online. So please, if you're online, do feel free to submit questions as well, and we'll have roving mics for that. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we'll stop at 8.30, and then you can all rush out and go and buy a copy of Venki's book, which I'm sure you really enjoy. So that'll be outside, and the bar will be open, which I'm very excited about too. So um, without further ado, I want to plunge straight in, uh, Venki. Um, what is it about death that scares us and fascinates us? I think, you know, as I point out, we may be the only species that's aware of mortality. Other animals are aware of death. For example, elephants are known to mourn their, uh, when young elephants die, they're known to mourn them, to even bury them. Uh, but the idea that we have a fixed lifespan and that all of us are going to die at some point regardless of whether we escape accidents and disease. Uh, that's something only humans, I think, realize. And the fact that we all know that one day we're not going to exist, I think, is something that probably was very disturbing. We usually probably found that out as a child. And to know that our parents are going to die and all of us are going to die uh, must have been disturbing. But we're, we're also, we've evolved to somehow bury it, and because otherwise it would be intolerable. We'd, we'd just be obsessing about it. And we've, we've learned to bury it. And it comes from the fact that we're self-aware, we have a consciousness, and we've developed language. So a lot of things that make us uh, 
unique in, in the animal kingdom also gives us that awareness of death and, um, and fear. It. Uh, not all the time, obviously, but it's, it's always there in the back of people's mind, this idea of mortality. And you talked there about you know, this idea that we all think that we have a finite time on this earth. Are we programmed to die? after a certain that, length of time. So people who sort of um, stumble into the field often think that, oh, death must be programmed for the good of the species, uh, et cetera. But these, are, these turn out to be uh, not, not correct ideas. They don't hold up to scrutiny. So if you look at uh, species, the record holder among the animal kingdom, I mean things that creep and crawl about, um, is the mayfly, and that lives only for a day. And at the other end, you have species like the Galapagos tortoise, which lives probably 170 plus years. So there could be one walking around, I mean, crawling around now <laughs> that actually encountered Darwin, oh, no, which is crazy. an amazing thing yeah. to think about. And then there are, um, there's the, the, a bow-headed whale, which uh, lives for two or 300 years. Mm. There's a Greenland shark, a species of which was uh, you know, known to have lived over 400 years. So you have this tremendous variation in lifespan, and that's what led to the idea that maybe uh, evolution has programmed each species to die at, uh, you know, with different lifespans. But it turns out the answer is uh, actually somewhat simpler than that. It, evolution doesn't care about how long you live. It really cares about fitness which is the likelihood, maximizing the likelihood of your being able to pass on your genes successfully. And so let's say you're a small animal like a mouse, then there's no point in evolution spending a lot of resources and biological energy uh, to maintain and repair the body so that it stays alive for a very long time uh, when you're going to be eaten or starved to death. And so the trade-off there is it's more advantageous. You're more likely to pass on your genes if you very quickly mature and very quickly reproduce. But it turns out some of the things that make you quickly mature also cause aging later on in life. So it doesn't matter if they're detrimental later in life if they help you uh, reproduce. And at the other end, it does make sense to live a long life because you have more time to find more mates and, and reproduce over a longer period. And also reproduction is more uh, time consuming in larger uh, species period of gestation. Yes, we take so longer. Yeah. So, so I think for each species, natural selection has worked out an optimum. And, and, that's, and we're sort of somewhere uh, on that curve. So th there are two questions that sort of arise from that. One is that actually over the past century or so, we've pretty much doubled our lifespan. And in fact, you can help me here because there are so many terms such as lifespan, life expectancy, health yeah. span. Could you just explain the difference yeah. between So I, I, I'd say what we've doubled is what's called life expectancy at birth, which is what is the likelihood, you know, of reaching a, a, what is the most likely age that you'll die at uh, when you're born. Now, that life expectancy at birth was very low uh, 150 years ago, but much of that was because of infant mortality. So children would die of uh, infectious disease or other uh, illnesses, malnutrition, starvation, things like that. And as we improve those things, our life expectancy uh, increased from sort of 35 to 40 uh, all the way into the 60s. But of course, now we live well past our 60s. So when Social Security was introduced, the life expectancy at birth was about 65. So half the people would have died before they were entitled to Social Security. Uh, but now, of course, we all outlive uh, Social Security, and that's because there has been progress at the high end. Uh, we know how to treat diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer, many of these diseases that uh, really increase, the risk of them increases with age. 
uh, we're, we're able to treat so people are surviving that. Lifespan is, is uh, you could think of lifespan as, as related to life expectancy. They're sometimes used interchangeably. It's the average uh, time that a, uh, an individual in a species lives. And uh, maximum lifespan is a different thing. It is how long could that species possibly live if everything goes well and they don't, you know. Don't get, get eaten. Awesome. Don't get eaten, don't starve, don't d die of infection or cancer or things. So where would you say that uh, the, the average human lifespan is at the moment? I think the average lifespan in, in Western countries is in the 80s. And it's slightly higher for women. Uh, and I think the co reasons for that are not very well understood. Uh, and in, in poorer countries, it's still uh, well in the 60s, even in uh, relatively poor countries. And that's quite a difference from, say, even 50 years ago. OK, so unfortunately, as, as we all know, we're not the same in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s as we were in our 20s, very sadly. Um, we age. What exactly happens when we age in the body? So um, I think aging can be thought of as a, an accumulation of damage due to, due to chemical damage uh, to our molecules and our cells. And by chemical damage, do you mean? For example, some... for example um, damage to our DNA, damage to the ensemble of proteins that, that exists in every cell, uh, possibly damage to the cell itself, damage to these organelles in our cells called mitochondria, which are where a lot of the uh, universal energy currency of the cell is made. And, and so, what's causing that damage? Um, the, the damage is largely due to uh, environmental damage. Um, it was thought, for example, for example, if you have nasty chemicals, they can affect your DNA, they can affect, uh, they can uh, change the nature of your proteins as well, uh, etc. And it was thought that, you know, if you got rid of all these external chemicals, there wouldn't be any damage. But actually, it turns out, and that was done here in London uh, by Thomas Lindahl, uh, he showed that DNA is susceptible to damage even just sitting around in water. And it turns out that all cells, even the most primitive bacteria all the way to, say, uh, humans like uh, 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 humans, have very sophisticated repair mechanisms. If you didn't repair the damage as it occurred, we wouldn't live very long. In fact, we could probably never have evolved into complex organisms. But we have these sophisticated repair mechanisms. And those repair mechanisms constantly survey uh, damage in the cell. And if there's too much damage, and it's not just DNA, they can sense other kinds of problems like stress, damage, etc., with the cell, they send the cell into a state called senescence. And senescent cells are abnormal cells which secrete inflammatory molecules, which then signal the immune system to come and clean it up and, and destroy it and so on. But as we get older, all these mechanisms break down. So we accumulate too much damage in our DNA. We accumulate too many senescent cells. Our mitochondria become dysfunctional. So all these things uh, start accumulating. Now, cells in us die all the time. And they're constantly being replaced. And we, we don't even notice. In fact, if you lost an entire limb, you'd still be alive and the limb would die. Would, you know, would be fine as far as your life goes. I mean, not quality of life, but you know, your actual ability That's to still, live. You'd still be alive. You'd still be yeah. alive and so oh. on. But, but I think what happens is if a critical fraction of cells in some critical system, you have to think of the human body as a system. If something happens to one of the critical systems, like our brain or our heart, then it prevents the body from existing as a, as a whole, as a coherent unit. And that's what we, we think of as death. 
And oddly, even when we die, most of our cells are still alive. In fact, you can donate entire organs to other people. <laughs> I think that was quite a revelation in the book when I was reading that. I hadn't actually thought about that before, this idea that when you're alive, your cells are dying all the time. And when you die, a lot of your cells are still alive or you know, a lot of your organs are alive. And that sounded yeah. quite So it's this odd. ability to function coherently as an individual. That's what we mean by being alive. And that's mm. what... Uh, that's what uh, we lose when we die. And I'm glad you mentioned senescence there, because I think some of us will have heard that term a lot. So why don't senescent, cell, uh, uh, senescent cells, why, why aren't they triggered uh, to self-destruct? They sometimes are. So when, uh, when um, a cell senses damage, you can, you can actually go in two routes. One is called apoptosis, which is a kind of suicide, so the cell mm -hmm. commits suicide. And the other is to send it into senescence. The idea behind senescence is, it's, senescence is often caused by, if there's damage, if the cell senses damage, it wants to, it thinks there's maybe something's wrong at the site of the damage. So it, it's a signal, senescent cells send out signals to the immune system, and and other, other cells to come in and repair the damage, for example, in a wound or an infection and mm -hmm. so on. So, so I think senescent cells have a purpose. It's just that as we age, instead of their normal purpose, we're accumulating too many of them, and that causes systemic inflammation and, uh, and, and aging. And aging. So, um, and tell us a little bit about telomeres and maybe some other pathways because, and the reason I want you to, to, to discuss some of these kind of ways that we, we, that we age is that first of all, some of them have very interesting stories behind, behind them, the science, which I'd love yeah. you to tell us briefly, but then I want, to tell, I want you to tell us how we can hack them or what the attempts are okay. to hack them. Well, telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes. So our, 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 the DNA in our chromosomes is a linear molecule and it has ends. And people realize very early on that when, you, when DNA divides, it has to, there's a starting point and it cannot replicate the part where it starts. It's, it's as if it's a locomotive sitting on a train track and it can only replicate the track in front of it but not the thing that's, that it started off immediately under it. And what this means is that each time a cell divides, the chromosomes get shorter and shorter. Now, normally you would think that would be terrible because you would start losing genes, but it turns out that when chromosomes are first made, in addition to the normal uh, genes on the chromosome, there are special structures that are added on to the ends called telomeres. These are repeated sequences. And when they shorten, you can afford to lo lose them up to a point. But one purpose of telomeres is also, also to form a special structure. And that's because the cell has no way of knowing whether the end of a DNA is actually a break in the DNA. And if it's a break in the DNA, it tries to repair it or it tries to uh, send this alarm signal to send the cell into senescence. And so these telomeres have a special structure, but when they become shorter and shorter, that structure unravels. And, and that's associated with aging, isn't and, it? And that's associated, well, not entirely. I mean, for example, our normal cells, when they're, they're final cells, such as skin cells or liver cells, they can only divide a certain number of times. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you're right. They go into senescence and then they're, they're destroyed effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so, again, that's a form of aging. Uh, now, cancer cells don't have that because the enzyme that adds those ends is inactivated in most of our cells, except for special cells that we have called stem cells. But in cancer cells, that enzyme is activated. So cancer cells can divide indefinitely, and that's one of the dangers. So when people say, so people, so to, to back up, one of the reasons people think that this mechanism evolved was as an anti-cancer mechanism. So you, that's why you switch off telomerase in most of your cells. So you don't, these cells don't become cancerous, uh, or, or they have, at least not by that mechanism. But if you have 
If you switch on telomerase, you run the risk of making that cell cancerous at some point because it may have other mutations that may predispose it. And cancer is a, doesn't happen with just one thing. It's a combination of things that leads to eventually to a, a cancerous cell. So, um, and this is true throughout uh, the sort of aging process. You see many of these things are to help us early on, for example, by preventing cancer too early at, at the cost of aging later. But if you fiddle with it, you know... But, oh, yeah. So if you fiddle it? with it, you're, you're running the risk of cancer. So I think, you know, people have, are trying to do this in mice. Uh, they're trying to get mice to have extra long telomeres and... Uh, seeing some benefits. They're also trying to see if they can use this to treat people who have diseases of short telomeres. And this is a way of, they want to transiently activate telomerase and then switch it off again. So they extend your telomeres just a little bit but and then switch so it off again. not so that you get cancer. And, and, you know, it's not clear in the long run how mm. the safety and efficacy are, are still quite a long way to from being established. And you'll hear this refrain over and over again because, you know, even if you take a simple drug like a statin, I mean, not so simple, but, you know, it's, it's got a single target, which is an enzyme that's involved in cholesterol synthesis. Even that took almost two decades to go from fundamental basic science to a pill that most of us uh, would take. And I think aging is far more complex than that and more difficult. Sure. And, and tell us about stem cell therapy, because that is something that you've, uh, you, you talk about in the book as being, you know, perhaps a promising sort of avenue to yeah. that. So if you think about a fertilized egg, that single egg develops into an entire, uh, you know, entire body. And so to do that, what it has to do is undergo a number of divisions and after a certain number of divisions, further divisions result in cells that are more specialized. So further down the road, they will only create other kinds, spe special kinds of cells. So initially, we have what are called pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that in principle could develop into any tissue. But later on, they become specialized. So some cells will uh, only generate cells of the of the blood, uh, blood system, including white blood cells and red blood cells of various types. Others will uh, generate skin and hair, and others will generate uh, neurons and so on. Now, of course, these stem cells are the cells involved in generating the final tissue. The final tissue, of course, simply exists, and you know, eventually, after a number of divisions, it dies, and then it has to be regenerated. So we're re regenerating tissue all the time uh, with our, the stem cells that are responsible for skin are constantly regenerating skin. So what you're saying is somewhere in our bodies we have this we have regenerative a, a, a capacity. Whole, yeah, a whole multitude of stem cells which are regenerating all kinds of our uh, tissues. In fact, they, the, the saying is that every seven years you're really a new person. Eh? Well, <laughs> well your, your neurons are not... Uh, right. All replaced. A very small number of neurons are actually replaced, but, but say your liver or your mm -hmm. uh, skin or hair or uh, red blood, or blood this, cells actually. and so on, <laughs> those you know yeah. do get replaced. So the question is, can as we get older, these stem cells also suffer damage, mm -hmm. and we have fewer of them, and we also have what are called clones. The, the, the remnants are just from a few clones. So they don't have the diversity and they don't have necessarily the best qualities to regenerate tissue. So the question is, can we coax our cells to go backwards a little bit and become stem cells? In other words, can a skin cell become a skin stem cell and so on? And uh, a few, maybe about 20 years ago, a guy named Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for his work, showed that you could put introduce four factors, two of which are oncogenes. In other words, they're potential cancer-causing genes. But anyway, he, he took these four factors and he was able to persuade an adult cell, a fully differentiated cell, 
to go all the way back to what's called a pluripotent cell, which is uh, a cell that could become any type of cell. Now, of course, if you went all the way back and started to develop many, you know, if you treat uh, things with Yamanaka factors, they often develop what are called teratomas, which are slow-growing cancer. And, and there could be other kinds of cancer risks as well. So it's not the sort of thing you might necessarily want to try it. Um, but, I, but what people have tried to do is, they've asked, can we introduce the Yamanaka factors transiently? So just for a brief burst, so that your cells go backwards, generate a few stem cells, and then you know they can you sort of reactivated the system or rejuvenated the system. Because I don't know about you, but I'm thinking Benjamin Button. Who, yes, who exactly. Kind of it's it's the, that that kind of clock. idea. It's that kind of idea. It's the only thing that other things will slow down aging. This is the only thing that has the potential to reverse yes, aging. It. And uh, again, you know, it's it's very complex technology. Mm. And its safety and efficacy in humans is, is, is not even beginning to be established. It's all the work done in mice so far. And, and tell us about also one of the things that there, there's been a lot of excitement about is a caloric restriction, just not eating very much. I mean, why would that potentially extend life? Yeah, this comes from the observation and again, starting in mice, but, it, but also was extended to worms and flies and other species, in, including monkeys, I should mm. say, um, that if you restrict calories, somehow these animals stayed healthy uh, longer and actually lived longer in many cases. And so the idea was that maybe caloric restriction is good for the aging process. It slows it down and, and uh, eliminate some of the health problems of aging. And it wasn't clear how it worked and until people found out uh, some, some pathways, some of which uh, weren't even known 30 or 40 years ago, like the TOR pathway and the IGF-1 pathway, which one of them has to do with uh, growth hormones stimulating your, um, uh, your cell growth. And another has to do with sensing nutrients uh, in the in the environment, and so these pathways were inhibited in caloric restriction. Inhibition of these calo pathways. So things don't happen. Things in don't the happen, body. and what didn't happen is that ce cells stop making uh, a lot of protein, and maybe making an excess of protein when you when you're older is is not such a good thing, because the quality control isn't great. Uh, many of them might aggregate and cause problems. And also that we have mechanisms in all our cells to recycle the garbage, you know, recycle anything that's defective uh, for degradation. And if you're consuming a lot of food, those pathways are suppressed. If you're eating less food, then those pathways are turned on, so you're actually recycling defective products in the cell better. This is a process called autophagy. So there's a number of effects. But do you, you don't need to make those proteins in that quantity? Well, you don't. It's always a balance, obviously, because you need proteins in order to survive. Proteins carry out uh, thousands of functions. But perhaps you're playing with the balance and getting the balance uh, to, to be somewhat healthier. So that's the theory, anyway. But I should point out some, some issues with that. One is. They've always compared animals that are on all-you-can-eat diet with animals that are calorically restricted, which is I want to just, the first one. just getting enough <laughs> calories so that they don't lose weight and they mm -hmm. don't starve. But all-you-can-eat diet is not good for anybody. You know, it's like comparing somebody who's very abstemious and eats well, or and eats very moderately, and uh, comparing that to somebody who goes every day to an all-you-can-eat buffet, right, and gorges on it. That, that's not a, not, not a great comparison. So I, I, I think if you look at animals in the wild, uh, they're not on an all-you-can-eat diet. They're you know, just barely getting enough to, to survive. So some people have questioned whether this is really due to caloric restriction or whether an all-you-can-eat diet is, is simply bad for you. But nevertheless, the idea is that there is a difference between those two, 
And that difference is probably due to these pathways. I always love the, you know, it's a very sort of old joke, isn't it? That if you cut down what you eat, you may not necessarily live a longer life, but it will just feel like it. Yes, that's yes. right. <laughs> so um, so um, what, one thing that really interests me in the book and, and actually just constantly interests me is the fact that some scientists working in this area do self-medicate. Yes, so, so one of the... So tell us actually, what they're using actually there are, there are, and whether There are a works. couple of drugs, I can tell you. So one is thought to affect one of these pathways, although it's not very clear how it works, but it's a widely used anti-diabetic drug called metformin. It's used mm -hmm. to treat type 2 diabetes. It improves your sensitivity to insulin. Uh, it may actually partly work as a, as a diet suppressant, appetite suppressant. Uh, that may be one of its oh, so beneficial it may effects. may feed back into the you know, caloric so, restriction. So, so, it, so that's one thing. And so, now, of course, if you're diabetic, the equation's very different. If you don't treat diabetes, it's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're, you're more, not, not just more likely to age, but you're likely to have all kinds of problems and also hasten your death. Uh, so for diabetics, there's no question that uh, having taking metformin uh, if you're diabetic, is, is, is a good thing. But of course, if you're perfectly healthy, the equation's different because metformin is not without side effects and that they've been uh, well documented. And so uh, it's not clear what the risk-benefit ratio would be. The other one is something that inhibits a, a really well-characterized, now well-characterized uh, caloric nutrient-sensing pathway called the TOR pathway. And that's called rapamycin. It was discovered completely by accident by people looking for soil bacteria that produced antibiotics on Easter Island. And the name of Easter Island is Rapa Nui. Uh, and so uh, it was called rapamycin. And then it turned out to be an immunosuppressant. So it was given to, uh, for example, people who are organ transplant recipients mm -hmm. uh, to prevent rejection of uh, the organ uh, grafts. So um, from there, it was then shown to inhibit this pathway. And then people found, I don't know exactly how they found it, but um, they found that it, in, in mice and other species, it extends lifespan. And can extend lifespan even in relatively older mice, the mice that would be the equivalent of 60-year-old humans. And many scientists who, uh, you know, read about this, and of course, uh, tech billionaires who like to uh, sort of biohack themselves, they go on all these compounds completely off prescription. So they somehow, by hook or crook, they get hold of rapamycin, they get hold of uh, metformin, and self-medicate. You know, and the. And what do you think of that? I mean, no, you're not tempted yourself with. I, I, I not. Well, you know, I have a. I have terrible shoulder pain due to osteoarthritis. And once in a while I think, you know, I should go on rapamycin. But of course it's silly, you know. I, 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 there are no clinical trials in humans. Mm -hmm. uh, rapamycin is an immunosuppressant. It can make you more prone to infections. It, it you know, slows down wound healing. It has uh, other effects, it lowers testosterone and things like that. So, you know, I, I think... Um, you know, these, the, these people must have uh, some extreme fear of aging and, and, and death, um, more than uh, most of us. They're say. billionaires, Frankie. Yes, they, they like, they, they like their life. lives, yeah. and they, you know, they don't want the party to end. <laughs> they want more of it. Um, so, now, this is, in some ways, a little bit depressing, because we're, we're, we're talking about longevity, and there's us thinking, you know, maybe we can live a bit longer. And going back to Jean Calmont, the, the French woman who died, that was back in 1997 and she was 122 and still has the world record, I think, for the yeah. oldest sort of confirmed person who ever lived. It's amazing to me that we're kind of, you know, 30 years on and we're still not budging the dial. So um, what do we do then? I mean, we... we how do we, if we are going to live longer, how do we live longer health, you know, in good health? Is, yeah. is that the point, is that we still have this 
kind of firmish cutoff point of 120, but we don't want to be spending the last 10, 20, 30 years of it in decline. How do we compress that morbidity as, as yeah, I think that, that that's a, that's an unsolved problem. And I, I, so just to get back to Jean Calmont, the 122 has not been broken, as you pointed out, for uh, the last 30 years, even though the number of centenarians, as uh, the queen or the king would have known, because they had to write letters to everybody <laughs> who lived over 100, uh, uh, you know, it's becoming an increasing uh, difficulty for them to write all these letters because the number of people over 100 <laughs> is increasing every year. Yeah. But the number of people over 110 is actually mm. not going up. And that suggests that we're reaching beyond 110, we're reaching some hard limit of our natural biology, and uh, which could be, uh, you know, do, and those people uh, are living that long, largely due to their genetic makeup, probably. And, and is there something special about them as a group? The, people are trying to find out. They're, they're sequencing their genomes. There are some candidate genes that seem to show up. Uh, but I don't think there's a, a definitive answer to either their lifestyle or, the, or their genetic makeup. I mean, Jean Calmont smoked a cigarette and had a glass of port every day after lunch for most of her life. <laughs> and, and ate two and a half pounds of chocolate, which I think I could get behind that. <laughs> it's like, there's that life plan every, right there. <laughs> every week. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the question is, uh, can you go beyond that? Well, I think, and also, can, I think what you asked is, can we stay healthy until we hit that limit? Mm. That's, to me, not so straightforward, because if you look at what has happened in the past, you know, most of us would live to 60s or 70s and so on. And then as each of these uh, diseases of old age uh, was being not solved, but at least tackled, uh, like diabetes, like um, you know, uh, high heart cholesterol, disease. Heart, heart disease, uh, cancer, etc., yeah. we also started living longer. And so the result is the fraction of our lives that we live in poor health has not actually gone down. And in fact, in the number of years since we're living longer and the fraction remains the same, we're actually probably spending more years with one or more morbidities. And you can see that from the explosive growth of care homes, nursing homes, et cetera, in most uh, developed countries. And this is not even to mention dementia, which is something that more and more people are having as they reach a certain age. And, and it's, it's now one of the leading causes of death in, in the UK, and for which we have almost no uh, real cure and, and, or even treatment. So uh, I, I think you know, this is a nice goal. The one thing that gives you, so uh, to back up, I'm not sure it can be achieved. And the reason is, if we stay really healthy, what would cause us to decline? And, and I point out there's a, an old poem from the 19th century by Oliver Wendell Holmes, an uh, American po writer, uh, called the One Horse Shay. A shay is a carriage for one or two people. And this One Horse Shay, it's called the Wonderful One Horse Shay. And it, it was designed so perfectly that all its parts would wear out at exactly the same time. So it wouldn't sort of lose things and that would need repair. And a farmer was riding along, and one second he was perfectly fine, merrily riding along, and the next second he found himself on the ground surrounded by a heap of dust because the whole carriage had disintegrated completely uh, under mm -hmm. him. Now, that's what we're asking. We're asking that we'll be perfectly healthy, and then suddenly things would just fall apart. And there's no reason for them to fall apart. So I think what more likely what would happen is one thing or another would start going, and then we would have uh, we would be postponing this problem of uh, decrepitude. But the one argument against that is an empirical one, which is that people like Tom Pearls, uh, who studies centenarians in Boston. Mm. Uh, have found that those people who live beyond 105 or 110 are remarkably healthy for a very large fraction of their time. And they do have this rapid 
decline uh, before they die. So somehow, those people have compressed their morbidity. And it would, I think it'll be interesting to see what is it about them. But finding out what it is about them doesn't mean that we can all do it ourselves, because it may be some unique combination of genes. And you know we can't engineer those things in us, and we might have different environments and so on. So the idea is that even if, um, what you seem to be saying is that even if we could cure the diseases that we associate with aging, such as cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, and high blood pressure, etc., that of itself wouldn't necessarily unlock greater lifespan. Well, it, it might, but I think you'd have to do more than these diseases. The people have done calculations which said, supposing you eliminated heart disease, cancer, and dementia, how much longer would people live? And they've arrived at estimates of about 15 years or so. So let's say if we live into our 90s now, it might get us to 105 or 110, uh, something like that. And then we would hit this natural uh, uh, limit of our biology. And at that point, I think various things start to happen. Regeneration becomes a problem. Uh, we start, as we start losing the ability to regenerate, we become frail. If our muscles become frail, then key muscles, like our heart muscle, can fail. Okay. So, so there are all sorts of things that, you know, eventually we reach the sort of end of our uh, warranty period. So, I, I want to move on. So you'd have to cure those things Sorry. in order to, if you want right. to. Right. So it's to much get more than it. just curing just the disease. The disease. Well, you could think of that as also part of aging. Yeah. You know, the the loss of ability to regenerate is part of aging. Yeah. So people in the aging field would say, well, that's very much a part of aging. And if we were able to regenerate, uh, you know, using stem cells or something, regenerate everything, then we would be able to uh, maybe surpass that. But regenerating the brain and neurons is, is really uh, an unsolved uh, thing, even for the most optimistic. So. Well, it doesn't matter so much because we're going to upload all our brains, aren't we? <laughs> to some yes, that's right. strange <laughs> portal where Elon yeah. Musk can come and... Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's <laughs> mistaking consciousness for something as purely a, an electrical uh, signal devoid of chemical input, for example, from hormones. Now, I'm going to just ask you a couple of things, just very quickly, and you can do yes or no answers. Um, we've all heard of cryonics, where people kind of freeze, freeze themselves. themselves. Or even just or, their head. Uh, yes. Does, is that likely to work? Uh, not as far as I can see. No, lovely. <laughs> OK. And um, blood transfusions from younger... Like, say, for example, if you transfuse blood from yeah, the young that, mice that to has an been mice? That has been shown in animals. Uh, for example, if you connect to a, a, an older rat to a younger rat, the old rat benefits by the blood from the younger rat. And, uh, and that's been shown to work uh, in multiple times. And so what people are trying to do now is see what is it in young blood uh, what factors in young blood are responsible. Maybe some of them are activating stem cells, others are possibly turning on repair pathways. We don't really know, and, and there are hundreds of factors uh, in blood. And at the same time, there are factors in old blood that are detrimental to the young animal, and so that it works both ways. And uh, of course, this hasn't stopped companies from uh, charging you know, I think $8,000 per transfusion. They, they get donations from young volunteers and, and produce, get young plasma and sell these to billionaires. Uh, who, Only in the Silicon who, Valley. Uh, who want sense. to live on. And of course, a famous one is Brian Johnson, who spends about $2 million a year on, mm. on anti-aging efforts. He has a whole, you know, that you can see on BBC well, iPlayer, there's a click program devoted to longevity. And a lot of it is about this guy and his house and all the gadgets he has. But one of the things he did was he involved, a, he had a, a multi-generational experiment involving his son and his father. And his son, who was in his late teens, would give him blood, and he would give blood to his father. And they did this experiment for a while. And then he uh, felt that it didn't show any effects, because he also measures all these markers for aging. Uh, 
you have to sort of admire his zest for data. You know, he collects all <laughs> these images of himself and, and, and does all these measurements. And uh, so he says he's a longevity pioneer or something like that. And he's doing this to provide data for the world. And, uh, but of course, you know, he also doesn't want to age. Yeah, although he's spending all of it, his time trying not to age, so he doesn't have much time to well, spend on anything else, it seems. You know, he's, he's made his money and he runs a bunch of investment funds. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I think he's probably got plenty of time on his hands. Um, I want to move to, towards the end of the book, which I found really fascinating. We're, we're, you expressed your views on kind of some of the more social aspects of ageing, of this kind of fad for immortality and so on. I wanted to, to kind of press you a little bit on that. So um, does it bother you that the idea of immortality kind of is regularly floated? People talk about living to 400, even 1,000. You know, there are longevity institutes that you know, all sorts of people yeah. are interested in this. Um, what do you think of, all, of, of that? I mean, is it all a scam? Well, I, I think a lot of it is in the science fiction stage at the moment, considering that we don't even have, um, you know, really validated clinical trials for many things that would simply make us healthier uh, in old age. You know, rapamycin, there's no, it's, it's validated as an immunosuppressor, but it's not validated for uh, life extension or, or, or healthier old age yet. And so I, I think these people are being extremely optimistic. And the problem is that investors, private investors, oh, well, first of all, I think aging research is extremely a legitimate uh, business because all societies are aging. And we need to figure out a way to uh, keep older people healthier, more independent, more productive uh, for as long as possible. So from that point of view, the idea of increasing health span is really a very worthy enterprise. And so if we understand the causes of aging, uh, which also, by the way, increases the risk of all these diseases like cancer, uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh, dementia, all of them have age as a common, aging as a common risk factor. So I think that's a very valid enterprise. But this idea of life extension beyond 120. Yeah, radical life Radical extension, life extension. And I think, cool. you know, the, the more reasonable end of the spectrum are people who say, well, the person who lives to be 150 has already been born. Mm. And they're counting on... You uh, don't believe that, do you? I, I don't believe that. Uh, I, I, think, I think 150 might happen at some point, uh, but I don't think the breakthroughs are imminent such that somebody already born is going to benefit from them. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, as, as somebody said, you know, Yogi Berra, and a, a famous American, uh, you know, fellow <laughs> said, that the future is always hard to predict. But <laughs> anyway, so, um, but, I, but I should say um, that this radical life ex extension, two, 300 years, 500 years, uh, that's really a pie in the sky thinking. And uh, one idea behind this is uh, a guy named Aubrey de Grey, who's uh, did a lot of, spent a lot of time in Cambridge, I should add. Uh, it's this guy with a messianic two foot beard. And he says that you can have longevity escape velocity. And what he means is that by the time 50 years go by, we'll have figured out how to get another 50 years. And by the time that goes by, we'll have learned to uh, get another 50 years. So in the end, you know, we'll just keep on living because advances will keep on happening. That'll get us a little bit further all along. And as long as it outpaces uh, chronological time, yes. uh, then, you know, we're, we're okay. Uh, that's what he calls escape velocity. Uh, so, uh, of course, very few real uh, aging biologists uh, would take that seriously at this point. But it does have, he does have a large following and he does get lots of funding. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, to me that just so shows a sign that people really just do not want to age and die and they're willing to invest in it. And, 
And I suppose that goes back to the, you know, if, if, we, if we say then, for example, say if you could, if science found a way of maybe not the escape velocity, but 150 years, 200 years for lifespan, should we take that chance? What are your well, thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, this is, uh, this is, that's a difficult question. I think if, if it's possible, it will happen. And, you know, we already live twice as long as, uh, say, people did 150 years ago. And we've had to make all kinds of social adjustments. And, for example, generation time has gone, you know, increased. People are not having children at age 15 or 16 anymore. We have almost double generation time to, to about 30 in the West. And fertility rates have gone down. So I think it will happen. And, and the reason, you know, there's the old joke about who on earth would want to live to be 100? And it's somebody who's 99. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, I, I think that's, that's a problem. And if somebody came to you and said, you know, here's a pill. If you take it, you'll get an extra 10 years of healthy life. You know, most of us would take it. In fact, I'm taking several anti-aging medications right now. I'm taking statins. I'm taking blood pressure medicines. These are all keeping me alive longer uh, than I would otherwise. I would have otherwise die of heart disease or a stroke or something. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we're all doing that. And so I think if, it, if it's possible, uh, it's likely to happen. Uh, otherwise, what you're going to have to tell society is, you could live longer, but we're not going to give you that treatment. You know, that, uh, that we're simply going to lock it away. But you can't really lock knowledge away like that. But if I, if I said to you, Venki, here's a pill that will give you 10 years of extra life, I can't vouch for its quality, would you take it then? Uh, that's a more tricky pr proposition. You know, mm. Then people might say, well, I'd rather, I, well, some people, more adventurous, maybe the Brian Johnsons might take it. And they would be at the vanguard of you know, the people who are taking rapamycin or mm -hmm. metformin now or, off prescription. They might well take it. They might say, hey, we'll give it a shot. You know, maybe it'll work and we'll, we'll live an extra 10 years. And these people will be at the vanguard of an experiment, of a social experiment. And then if it, you know, so I, I, I think that's, it would depend on how well it's tested. I, I, I would be personally reluctant to, to do it. But my, my other concern is that we're sleepwalking into a possibility where everybody is living much longer. Even if we lived, all lived to be 100, society will have to change. And, and living to 100 is, is really actually quite feasible, I think, you know, with advances in health and, and possibly uh, anti-aging uh, interventions. And so if we were to st all start living, and already we know lots of people who live into their 90s. I mean, my dad is 98. And... Um, you know, people, That's why you're not worried. People, people, <laughs> You've got good genes. <laughs> and people who live, you know, if somebody dies today in their, uh, say, early 70s, you know, even when I was young, that would be considered fine. But now it's mm. considered, oh, well, you know, it was a bit early, mm. you know. So, so I think, you see, things have already been increasing. And we have to figure out what to do with a society where everybody's living uh, for quite a long time. What, what worries you about it, though, is is it... Because I'm, in the book, you talk about um, the idea of almost like a creatively stagnating society. I because think you so. you think people do good work when they're young and not so good work when they're older. I, I think, you know, some of my academic colleagues will, will hate me for it. <laughs> but, but, but I do think that if you look retrospectively at scientists' careers, you'll find that they the thing that they're known for most is, is usually things that they did when they're young. Afterwards, they're doing incremental work which builds on what they did, but the big breakthroughs, the big creative breakthroughs often happen when you're young. And I think it's not just a question of physiological health, that they were healthier and not as aged. I think it also, the, I mean, that could be part of it, but it's also the fact that when you're young, you're seeing things fresh. You're, you're coming to it with fresh eyes, without too many biases. 
you're more open-minded. And this is the reason that both in science, but also in many other disciplines, including writing, and I point out that Ishiguro point did an analysis and asked, you know, look at authors, even Tolstoy or others. He wrote War and Peace before he was 40, you know? So, so I think, you know, you, you, people always think, well, if you're a writer, as you get older, you're, you have more wisdom and more insight and you might write better works, but it actually turns out not necessarily true. I'm going to put my science hat on here and say I'd like to see the science, scientific study on that. Um, but what, so what about intergenerational fairness? Yeah, I, that's another problem. So if you have people living longer, oh, people as they age uh, accumulate a number of things. They accumulate wealth. So uh, the oldest sec section of the population is actually much richer than young adults. Uh, they own property, they have accumulated wealth, etc. They've accumulated political power, they've accumulated networks. Uh, older scientists are far more influential. They, have, you know, they know how to get funding, they have, they have name recognition. Uh, so I think th there is this question of intergenerational fairness, of you know, hanging on too long, and uh, you know, especially if resources are limited and um, I do feel duty bound to point out that you're still running your lab. <laughs> it's it's true, but I am retiring next year. You'll be glad to know. So what will you do? Uh, I don't know, but I, I, I can do lots of things, but they don't, I won't have to take up, you know, funding from the MRC and valuable lab space at the LMB, which is, you know, at a premium. So um, at least I'll, I'll give those up. And um, what would as we're coming to, towards the end now, what would be your advice for somebody who does want to live as healthy a life as, for as long as possible? What, what can they do practically? Well, I mean, the standard advice is, um, you know, eat, eat moderately and eat a balanced diet that includes fruits and vegetables and exercise regularly and also uh, sleep, which is very much underappreciated. Uh, turns out to be extremely important for a variety of uh, pathways involved in aging. And uh, so this is advice that has been given to us for probably you know, many generations. Uh, but I think what has happened is that the, all of the work on aging, on the biology of aging, has validated that advice. We now know why uh, these, this advice actually works, what pathways it affects, what does it actually do. And so, uh, and not all advice would be uh, that useful. There are probably lots of advice that won't hold any uh, particular water. So I think that's, that's true. And then there are also things like social aspects. You know, people say loneliness is very bad, uh, having social, socialization, stress, etc. But I think all of those things are related. And physiologically, they uh, probably come down to similar uh, pathways. But I should point out, I tried all of these things and yet my blood pressure and cholesterol uh, <laughs> kept creeping up until I had to take drugs, right? And so I think one of the goals of the aging community is that you, know, you can maybe go beyond uh, this advice and try to uh, help people stay healthy. And your, and your reflections on you know, the, you, you talk at the end of the book about actually we have a limited time on this earth. And actually you seem very sort of sanguine about, about that. Yeah. That was, Unlike Brian Johnson. <laughs> yeah, so I think there are way, well, the pro, you know, I, I wouldn't take it too seriously because I don't see death as imminent, so I can afford to be <laughs> philosophical, right? I mean, you'd have to ask me when I'm closer to, to what I think is, you know, the end point. And, um, but I, I think, you know, I met this guy in India who claimed he wasn't afraid to die. And, and uh, I said, well, how do you know? Everybody is afraid to die. And he said he was bitten by a, a highly venomous snake. And he realized at the time that he wasn't afraid. You know, he wasn't afraid that he was going to die. He, he was just very calm about it. And I, so I asked him why he thought that. He said, well, look, we have to regard ourselves as part of life sort of like the cells in our body keep dying all the time and re, you know, new cells are made. And we have to think of ourselves as 
individuals as sort of cells in this broader uh, organism, which is uh, you know life on Earth. And you know our time comes and goes, but life on Earth will keep going, and 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 that's okay. Uh, now I don't know what he'll be like when he's. Uh, well, actually, he was close to death, and that's why I, I tend to believe him. Um, but you know, that's a, that's very philosophical. But I I think it's very hard to predict what people will be like when faced with uh, aging and when faced with uh, you know prospect of dying. It's uh, you know my sister, who's a physician, told me that even people and she treats these tertiary infectious diseases, you know, really complicated cases. And she told me even these people, you know, somebody who's got AIDS and has an uh, infection in their brain and so on, and, you know, pretty hopeless that, you know, you, if you ask them, you know, do you want us to take extra measures to keep you alive? And they all, many of them say yes. You know, they, even at that point, they, they want to live, and I think part of it is the fear of not, not existing. This is the ex only existence we know. And uh, so I have some, I mean, I wouldn't want to be like them and be obsessed about it, but I can sort of understand these mm. uh, billionaires, you know, who are enjoying their lives and, uh, you know, don't want to die. I just think it's, uh, they're tilting at windmills at the moment. I think that's a really good place to to uh, end our conversation and, and throw the floor open to questions. Um, we have some roving mics, I think, um, and also we'd welcome questions from online if there are any. Um, so we have a gentleman here. I might put my glasses on for this to see who else would like to ask a question. So. I listened to us talking about biology and ways of making the body repair itself and so on and so forth. And I wonder, what about cybernetics? My father was a, a cyborg. He had a pacemaker. And he suffered from oxygen-deficient dementia. And uh, I wonder what you see as the future of, of cybernetics in not so much um, expanding uh, lifespan, but health span. So just replacing bits of the body with... So, for example, when my father got a pacemaker, um, it really brought him back to life. But oh, I see. So you're, you're, you're talking about synthetic replacements for parts of the body. Yeah, for example, right. if you have a, a break in the spine, you can try to repair it with uh, oh, stem cells. Well, I think for many things that's uh, going to work. Uh, for example, you know, hip replacement is routine now. As you pointed out, pacemakers uh, help with you know arrhythmia. Um, people are also thinking whether they can grow uh, human organs uh, in animals for transplant sure. and so on. Uh, but, you know, you can do that for things that are localized uh, and can be isolated and, and replaced. Uh, but many of our things are highly interconnected. For example, our, uh, you know, blood system, uh, our, you know, system of stem cells throughout the body, etc. So not everything, I think, can be replaced even by biological uh, material, uh, let alone by, uh, you know, artificial substances. So I, I think as a general solution to aging, uh, I'm not sure uh, it's going to work. But I think it'll help with individual causes uh, of problems as we age, uh, such as deteriorating joints or uh, possibly even deteriorating organs. And things like my father's dementia, for example. Well, the brain is going to be really, really hard to replace because, Agreed. you know, it's uh, how would you regenerate? You know, that's not a question of just taking an organ that has to uh, produce Thank enzymes you. for metabolism. That has a, a bunch of things stored that are unique to the individual, all its memories and, and its, uh, you know, way of, ways of thinking, etc. That's going to be uh, very, very hard. I'd love some more questions. And currently, probably in the realm of science fiction, I should yeah. say. Yeah. I think Can we've got a question here? Oh. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, we're going to move on to another. There's a question down here and there is a question down here, but I want to take one from somewhere else as well at the back. There's one there. So if we could take... Could, could we have the questions? Maybe I'll take these two first and then we can take them together. Just, just rather put a plug in for old timers, Venky, especially since you're retiring. Uh, Ishiguro did say of himself it took 25 years for him to become a, a good writer, whatever he said about other folk. And Beethoven was still creating plenty in his 50s, so maybe there's hope for us old timers yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And we have a, a question down here and one up there. First of all, thanks for the um, amazing presentation and uh, good questions. Uh, that was very interesting. My question is just around your central idea that there is almost a natural expiry date that all organisms have. And so we might have some whales that can make it to 400 and mayflies that make it to one day. And we're somewhere kind of around the 100 to 120. Um, but have there been um, any tests on shorter lived animals to show maybe the relative power of interventions? So if relative you, power of relative, relative power, power of, of interventions. all the interventions that you could make. So if you take, let's say, mice and you do absolutely everything to extend their life, do you get to like two x? Do you get to three x? What's the what's the upper end? Of, yeah, that's interesting. Like so how much you can bend this natural. Um, yeah. So I think with. What I would call chemical interventions, such as, say, rapamycin or caloric That's restriction, or, yeah. it, they gain. A, I think the figure I remember is about thirty percent. Okay. It's not a factor of two. No. However, there are genetic mutations, uh, including in worm, first discovered in worms, uh, that make a single genetic mutation can make a worm live twice as long, and. It turns out those worms are not tired and doddering worms. They're actually pretty active and, uh, you know, frisky worms, as Cynthia <laughs> Kenyon uh, like to call it. However, I should point out those worms are unable to compete with wild-type worms in a petri dish. And what this means is they pay a penalty. They don't grow as fast. They're not as fertile, uh, etc. So. Uh, there's always these trade-offs in life that we, uh, you know, can't be sure of. And some, uh, one gene that uh, is overrepresented in uh, centenarians is called APOE. Now, they have a variant that protects them against Alzheimer's more, and that may be related to also their, uh, to their longevity because it's related to quality control and ability to uh, dispose of defective products. But that same variant makes them more prone to cancer and more prone to uh, COVID, dying of COVID. So, you know, it's, it's always a trade-off. It sounds know. like swings and roundabouts, yeah. doesn't it? And I can't get frisky worms out of my head. <laughs> That's brilliant. So there's, um, there is a question at the back, and there's also a lady on the same row and one there. So let's take... Can, can, could you just say your question, all three of you? And then, um, and then we'll take we'll try to take them all in, in turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the fascinating talk. Uh, um, uh, there, there are lots of thought provoking. Um, Sorry, could, could you, you please could speak, you speak a little louder? louder? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, thought provoking um, ideas uh, uh, in the uh, in the fascinating lecture. Uh, my question was though, uh, how how cell actually sense it is being e uh, aged? So how do they uh, like? Ian will much um, dolly the sheep. So when it was cloned, uh, but the the aging of that cell uh, that made the dolly the sheep uh, had the fibrosis uh, that killed it. Now, is okay. it the genetic diversity as well uh, that 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 uh, uh, makes the senescence and death program uh, the program the um, longevity? Uh, at a certain level, or is it the evolution that 66 million years ago, when dinosaurs were wiped out, some some of the mammals they lived, and 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 uh, okay. is there something related to that? 
All right, thank you. Yeah, we'll, so we'll take the. We'll, we'll just. Should we just take all the the questions? And yeah, I'll try to remember them. That's. Right, I'll, <laughs> I'll write them down. Don't forget, I'm getting old, and my short-term <laughs> memory is not that great. <laughs> is it me? Yeah. Thank I think you. I just wanted to oh, ask you. Yes. So should we? Should we? Sorry, if you've got if you've got the microphone, you can. Uh, yes, the, yeah? this lady here with the red microphone. Yeah. OK. <laughs> I just wanted to hear your thoughts, a few more thoughts on why we live. Because I heard you say that um, it was connected to reproduction, but why we live so long beyond reproduction? Because you, um, w women, on average, live now... A third of their life will be beyond their reproductive years. Six. And you also said that women, we know, tend to live longer than men. Men can, until quite late in life, continue to sire children. So I'm just intrigued because those facts don't seem to fit together. Lovely, thank you. And Very good the, the, the lady, the other lady with the microphone, Thanks what was your much. question? Uh, my question is around animals that live a phenomenally long life, so the 400-year-old animals. Do we have an understanding of the cellular mechanisms that are different in those animals that make them live? You alluded to telomeres, and I'd wondered whether there's some understanding around that, perhaps that points to why these animals can live? And then what are the trade-offs in terms of not acquiring things like cancers in these animals? What do Super. we understand of that? Lovely. So those Fair. two questions go Fair. together, don't they? Which ones? The, the, the <laughs> <laughs> but, so the very first question we had, if I'm about just my memory now, about, yes, is it, how do cells sense okay. that they're... Excellent. Their so, age? So, so, yeah, and then we will come to the... Uh, women living long after reproduction, because that's also a very good question. So, uh, now these are three really excellent questions. So, um, in terms of Dolly the sheep, I think Dolly was a very sick sheep. It, it was cloned from an adult cell. So people thought, well, an adult cell has accumulated a lot of damage, and so uh, this sheep already started off as an old sheep and therefore couldn't live a normal uh, life. And, and Dolly died at about half the life expectancy of a sheep and was very sick for much of its life. But it turns out Dolly was an outlier. There were other cl sheep cloned at the same time. They all had D names like Daisy and Deborah and Dorothy and so on. And they all lived uh, completely normal lives. And what this suggests is, so that means that you had taken a a cell from an adult sheep, made it go backwards into the equivalent of a fertilized egg, and developed a whole new sheep from it, which then lived a whole extra life. And so it was as if you had reversed the aging clock. And of course, we all do that all the time. You know, we, you know when a child is born, its, its age is zero regardless of whether its mother was 40, its parents were 40, or whether their parents were 20. You know, it still uh, starts at zero. And so this has to do with resetting uh, something called the epigenetics markers on the DNA back to uh, zero and letting it start over again. Now, of course, that can only buy you, it certainly buys you a certain amount of time I'm not sure it's going to buy you a thousand years. You know, you see what I mean? There's going to be gradual uh, damage, and there's also a huge amount of selection. These clone uh, cloning procedures are highly selective. Most of them uh, turn out to be defective at either the implantation or the embryo stage, and are and never make it as as full time uh, animals. Now, what was the other question? Right, the the. the lady on the same row had a sort of semi-related question. She was talking about the very long-lived animals. So, oh, yeah. And, and that's a, that's a great it, question. What so, is it about their cellular mechanism? Yeah, so there is a... Live that long? Yeah, there's a, a, a paradox called Pito's paradox after the person who, uh, uh, you know, identified it, which is if you have a long, large animal, it has many more cells. And therefore, even if one of them becomes cancerous, they ought to get cancer. Uh, you know, the more they're more like should be more likely to get cancer, but in fact they don't. And it turns out that very large animals uh, have repair pathways. For example, DNA uh, damage repair pathways uh, that 
uh, are perhaps better at maintenance and repair uh, than smaller animals. They also have slower metabolism, and that also is related. It's, if you have a faster metabolism, you're more likely uh, to have a shorter lifespan. It's inversely related. So the Greenland shark can barely move. You know, it's extremely slow. It has, um, you know, and its body temperature is quite low. So, and same with the Galapagos tortoise. Their, their metabolisms are quite slow. Uh, and I don't know about the bowhead whale because it's a mammal, and so it's warm-blooded, and it's not clear how it manages to live two or 300 years. But generally speaking, they do have uh, more uh, repair pathways. There's one particular uh, protein which is involved in the DNA damage response called P53. It turns out elephants have something like 20 copies of it, you know, compared to a mouse, which um, might only have one. Excellent. Now, about menopause, menopause is a very puzzling phenomenon. The idea that it occurs at a point and then, uh, you know, our species lives long after uh, menopause. And it might, it's, it seemed to be something of a puzzle. And there are all kinds of social explanations uh, postulated for menopause. And by the way, only a few species that we know of undergo true menopause. One of them are killer whales. And uh, even elephants, although they, elephants' fertility declines with age, it's not zero. It's not this sharp you know, cutoff uh, that, we, uh, that we have in humans. And uh, so one idea is that um, original idea was called the mother hypothesis, which is that you need to survive long enough to bring up your offspring until they're independent and can survive on their own and become mature and are able to reproduce themselves. Because if you die before that, then you know, the chances are they'll die and you won't be able to pass on, your genes won't be passed on. And since humans have such a long period of childhood and dependency, you have to live that much longer after your last child. So that's, that was one theory, okay? And of course, in the past, you know, most of us didn't live much past menopause age. We, you know, most humans died uh, around 35 or 40, and it's only a few that survived uh, much beyond that. The other idea was called, is called the grandmother hypothesis, which is, is that it's more advantageous for a woman to spend resources on raising, helping raise their grandchildren in the, you know, her own or, or, or in the family uh, compared to producing more children of her own. There's also risk with childbirth as you get older. So that's another idea, but people argue it's never better to invest in people who have only a quarter of your genes when you could produce offspring which have a half your genes. And so you don't evolutionarily want that one, do you? you you're not a fan of the I, I'm not a fan of the grandmother hypothesis. I think it's evolutionarily it doesn't make sense. But one idea is that these are all what are called adaptive theories. They're theories that it somehow benefits the group. And evolutionary biologists generally don't like these things that benefit the group. Unless, of course, the group is all related, highly related genetically, like bees in a colony. Uh, then it does make mathematical sense, but otherwise it doesn't, there's, uh, any such theory would, would result in genes that are unstable. But the other idea is that we only started living much longer about 40,000 years ago. And so the number of eggs and age of menopause was really matched our life expectancy 40,000 years ago, and it simply hasn't had time to adjust to our, our longer uh, lifespan. And that that's, strikes me as a more reasonable uh, explanation. Excellent. I think we have uh, a question or two from online. Yes, we do. Yeah, we have one question uh, coming in here from Kishore Makam. Uh, what's your opinion about resveratrol as an anti-aging agent? A lot of controversy about that in the scientific <laughs> yes, community. I <laughs> is that the so, ingredient that was supposed to be in wine? 
this is just the ingredient in red wine, and you know all these enophiles were, uh, you know, jo you know, ecstatic when it was shown that resveratrol uh, would increase um, the thing. But I, actually, resveratrol was thought to be a sirtuin uh, activator. And uh, it turns out. What, what is a sirtuin activator? Uh, or, or sorry about that. Very, very broad. <laughs> yeah, so a sirtuin. So people did experiments in yeast. After the discovery that you could get mutations in worms that doubled their lifespan, uh, somebody named Leonard Guarente at MIT uh, did experiments in yeast and isolated mutations which mapped to a protein that uh, effectively added a, uh, w well, removed an acetyl group, uh, removed a chemical group from uh, molecules. And in particular, it might have removed them from uh, molecules that were involved in whether genes would be active or not active. So it was thought that maybe it's controlling some sort of the way in which cells express genes, and that's how it might exert its effect on longevity. And then people started looking for compounds that would activate these molecules. And it turned out that, um, that one of them was identified to be resveratrol, which is an ingredient in red wine and also in other uh, compounds, I believe berries and things like that. So this uh, caused a flurry of excitement and uh, you know, people founded biotech companies that were sold to Glaxo Welcome for $750 million. And I'm sure uh, some of the early investors were very happy. But Glaxo Welcome, uh, 20 years down the line, really didn't come up with anything and eventually closed down the division that, um, uh, you know, was dealing with this. And subsequently, uh, lots of experiments have cast doubt on that whole idea. And uh, I think most uh, aging specialists that I've talked to uh, don't really subscribe to it. But I should say uh, the original discoverers still, uh, you know, hang on, you know, are, are convinced that their uh, ideas are correct and they're not uh, willing to concede. And this reminds me of uh, Max Planck's dictum. Max Planck was a famous physicist and he said, you know, ideas don't change because the people who formulated a theory uh, are convinced that their theory was wrong and, and you know, agree with some new uh, uh, concept. Rather, they just die, and then a new generation comes along that just simply ignores uh, what they've found. And, and uh, you could put this as science marches on one funeral at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's how it is. But, but of course, you know, uh, the people who believe in, in uh, the SIR2, uh, you know, related uh, aging uh, causes uh, still stand by it, I should say. Yeah, I think that's a really good point at which to, which to end. Thank you very much for all the questions online and in the room. But most of all, uh, our thanks to you, Venki, for an incredible talk and discussion, conversation today. It's been amazing. Thank you. Our thanks to our speakers tonight and for the wonderful chairing by Angela. Uh, please do come outside and uh, check out the bookstall as well and, see, and safe journey home. Thank you. And, and have your glass of red wine. <laughs> <laughs>